then uh, did well in due time. At this moment, research is an occupation with a lot of techniques that have to do with writing a project, talking about experimental design, and keeping your own laboratory force and yourself employed on the support of some grant that's obtained here or there. Well, that's the mechanics. I'm asking about the desirability of its inclusion in the substance of a three-year residency program. Well, regardless of these mechanics, you can include it if you so desire. You don't have to have this elaborate uh, research instrumentation of research. Research ought to be defined as organized curiosity. And it should be uh, encouraged in people who have the curiosity, not developing projects and say, will you become interested in this, but rather finding people who have a native interest and then pushing them in their direction. That's right, because there's a lot of men who have no facility at all in research. Okay, so this is a shibboleth, yeah. trying to make everybody do something. We should get research a little bit back more to its grandparent discovery, in other mm -hmm. words. Well, is this to be then, is this sort of a, a a laissez-faire attitude about research on the part of the program director, his senior and junior instructors? No. Or is it to be encouraged? Uh, I'm trying to think of it in encouraged terms of Encouraged is a good word. You know Dave Slight? Yeah. Well, Slight tells me this about a certain hospital in Scotland. The, di the director of the place felt that they should do some research, and he had a lay board of directors, and he was telling the board about this, and the chairman of the board says, well, there's something wrong with you doctors, you don't do these things right, now why don't you just do it this way, doctor, why don't you just get your staff and tell them, now look, we will assign you certain hours each day, and you just research. <laughs> now, uh, you, you can't do it that way. It, there's got to be something in the way of uh, what you call organized curiosity here that operates with the hope of discovery. Is there anything that you can do to facilitate the organization? Oh, yes. Yes, I think you do a lot of things. Is it desirable as an additional component of a three-year curriculum designed to train psychiatric generalists? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it's going to have to be a lot of raising of questions which will interest people, and maybe engaging them in some uh, participative project. And somewhere along the line, we have failed to, to get enough uh, awareness as to how curiosity can be organized. We are notoriously weak on how to organize research which, if successful, the results will be meaningful. We either go all out for quantitative research or else we say, uh, let's leave it alone, there's nothing that can be done. We have not yet been able to get enough people with courage in the field of psychiatry who will develop a kind of research and the kinds of research tools which are applicable to our data. And the statisticians tell us over and over that you, you, those of you who try to use the methods of the natural sciences uh, in a slavish manner are just, uh, sure. just using sure. the wrong tools. Sure. You're appalled by the gadgets yeah. and the instrumentation. Well. Since we're concerned with clinical psychiatry, and we have now announced the fact that research in clinical psychiatry is de classe, in our recommendation... Not in our minds, but no, in the, in the general folklore. tenor of things, should we lament this fact, propose that it be remedied, try to act the role of Canute and stop the tides from rolling? What? Yeah. As, as our particular contribution to this conference, what is our stand with regard to clinical psychiatric research? How or about that as an assignment for Sisler? Hmm? How about that as Sisler an assignment? Handle it? I don't know if he can handle it. We want he to can hang prepare, that on, prepare on something. Uh, Cameron, too? Well, he was concerned well, with content, uh, wasn't he? 
Who? Camera. camera. The content of the program. And I would suspect... Know how to teach it. This here isn't oh. Harvey Thompson. <coughs> we better do this ourselves. The questions that you've raised today, many of them uh, will require some research for their answer. And, uh, of course, getting down to our clinical material, there are many things that uh, we could do some research about. We've left the biochemist on the one hand uh, do the research, even doing violence to some of our uh, concepts and to our, our experience in which the concepts are based. And on the other hand, we've left the psychologist the show on the psychological side. And we're stuck in between. We feel uh, that we are less experts than either of these people in using the tools and the palaver of research. And they've been able to get their ideas across. But unless you come up to them, you won't get it. Yeah. Well, well then, then here's a question that stems from this. Is it desirable then for, since we have conceived psychiatric teaching to be a unique kind of relationship and having spent most of the morning talking about it, uh, this has been the first time in 10 years that there has been a conference convened to inquire into it. Is this a desirable thing? Should a conference such as this for teachers of clinical psychiatry to get together more often? Is this a reasonable recommendation of such a conference? The sharing of teaching methods? I, I'm reminded of your point five on page three. Familiarization with other teachers' experiences written and per preferably personally exchanged. What was your notion in that regard, Omar? Well, uh, the, it doesn't exist. Uh, in my experience. What exists in my experience is uh, that our department uh, uh, once a year uh, uh, gets all its subunits together uh, in the form of a conference and they uh, spend two, three days together familiarizing each other uh, with uh, what is going on in the department research-wise. But uh, no such teaching uh, 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 formations are uh, held other than uh, uh, a reasonable facsimile of that in what we call the ad hoc committee on teaching and planning in the department of which I'm chairman uh, that's been in existence now about uh, 10 years where we usually uh, discuss such issues as uh, uh, curriculum content uh, uh, instructor selection uh, uh, coordination with other departments, uh, but no, uh, nothing like this exists in terms of uh, residency teaching. There's a whole topic on teaching. Well, topic 10, how describe the obligations of the psychiatrist as a teacher in medicine and in the community? What educational methodology may be taught to assist in the discharge of these obligations? Under this topic heading, special emphasis should be given to the content and methodology for both graduate and orientation training in psychiatry for non-psychiatrist physicians, particularly general practitioners. Similarly important would be the role of psychiatrist as a teacher in orienting his community to psychiatric aspects of a that's wide range of Yeah, that's a different kind. We're, we're talking about the teaching of clinical psychiatry. Yeah, we're talking about it too, the teacher All right. in medicine. Well, then here is know, this other thing. We're if talking about teachers teaching teachers residents. Teaching They're talking residents. about teachers teaching everybody else. See, I bring in this question now. Since the operations of clinical psychiatry include the functions, the collated functions, hopefully, of others than clinical psychiatrists as teachers, what's the, our, our obligation with clinical psychologists, social workers, psychiatric nurses, public health people, all the rest of this, in the teaching of the psychiatric resident? We've not addressed ourselves to this aspect at all. Mm -hmm. The team and uh, how to make it work and uh, what it takes to make it work is a major problem. 
Uh, what's the essential thing in making any team work? Any kind of a team? People uh, seeing eye to eye. Well, that is, there must be some uniformity of information in a team for head to foot. There must be some demonstrated competence in carrying out the kind of activities that this information predicates, and there must be one other thing, and that's leadership. And there's a, conti a continuous flow of encouragement and understanding from the person at the top to all members of the team that their efforts are being noticed, being appreciated, and being and for the development of the well, team, this is the essential. Let me throw something on the table. It is my impression that there is an unwarranted and undue degree of egalitarianism among the very the several teachers who are concerned as members of the team with the teaching of residents, i.e. The psychiatrist, the social worker, the psychologist, and the others all come in on the plane uh, on a plane of equality, so to speak, in providing this. This is all important, and I would raise the question as to whether it really is, or whether see we have now done away with the term ancillary, and they are now co-professional. We're according them status, and I wonder. How much do you allow the camel to get his nose, head, neck, body, tail into the tent, and wherein does this thing stop? I think it has to do with the history of the development of the thing, how this got started. There was a day when there was leadership for the team, and the team was established, and it did good work. And then, this pattern having been established, people say, let us do likewise. So without that history and without that leadership, they copy the pattern. We see the same thing, of course, in the what, the degeneration of psychoanalysis. They get a pattern fixed. It's orthodox. This is what you do. The pattern, the technique becomes everything. And then, of course, the egalitarian aspects of the team are predominant and you have competition and rivalry or usurpation of the leadership within the team. Yeah. We should quit fussing about who is at the top of the heap in prestige uh, with respect to psychiatry, social work, social worker, the psychologist, uh, and what have you, but rather uh, go ahead on the assumption, which I think is a true one, that the psychiatrist is central and that he should earn his central position by being capable in a wider range of situations than anyone else. And he has the law behind him, or at least up to now he has. And instead of saying the psychiatrist is the most important member of the team, Thank we should say down. the psychiatrist should be, if he is the right kind of a person, mm -hmm. the it's key fine. person on the team. That is, uh, Get right. I got rid of this inferiority complex. The reason I was you know, interested right. in the late show last yeah, night is that a direct bearing on this point. It concerned the death of a leader of a cavalry troop out west, and the only officer present was the medical officer. And at the request of the expiring man, he then assumed charge of the, two, uh, the troop as a line officer. Mm -hmm. And this recounted his struggles in establishing his position, and of course he was, in the end, quite victorious, not only in carrying through with his resentful cavalry subordinates, but with an infantry detachment whose colonel had a stroke and uh, couldn't exercise his functions, and this fellow took over and he carried them through to success. What about now, I hate to introdu introduce a pet thing that uh, I repeatedly observe about the boss, that there's one thing he can delegate, and that's the boss. scapegoat function. That he's the only guy that right. <laughs> people can be sorry at, so they don't have to be sorry at each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how to train people for this tremendous uh, responsibility and unpopularity, you might say, uh, and how to... Uh, uh, help him put it back to work. Uh, this, uh, well, that's the problem we have in, in trying to maintain executive health. The higher up a person gets in an organization, 
the more isolated he becomes, the less truth he hears, uh, the more uh, people put their, uh, their best foot forward so that he can't judge them, the more he has to cultivate the habit of learning what is going on through inferences, through private unofficial sources of information, that he must uh, be aware that they do not hate him when he is a scapegoat, but that they are working out through him yes. some of their attitudes toward authority, and when he sees that, then he can adopt, if he's the kind of a person he ought to be, a judicial attitude about it, a non-punitive attitude. Haldem has his disadvantages. Non-seductive, non-punitive. <laughs> Who the hell is such an Go angel? <laughs> but this, uh, this is a quality that can be learned, uh, but not everybody can learn it, I'll admit that. It is the person who has a long sulking period, the one who must be admired at all times, uh, the one who's unduly sensitive about his prerogative, just not going to make a good head of a department. The one who cannot tolerate anybody better than he is. We see so many of those. And who can't stand the necessary isolation yeah. that this position puts you in. Well, how does one go about evaluating the results of teaching activities? That Holton Laborski experience comes to my mind, the one down at Menninger Clinic. And you can hardly take successful passing of the American boards as the criterion or the successful completion of the residency training program or the personal attestation of the number of patients you got well or the number that committed suicide. What criteria do you use? Well, you don't have very good ones so far, and most of the attempts to get them haven't been too good as tabulating the information at a certain period in the careers of a group of people all in a pretty uniform situation, say medical students on entering the medical school and then following them for 10, 15, 25 years. We're just beginning researches in this area, for instance, and in trying to find out the effect of very early childhood experiences on the uh, later uh, characteristics of the individual, what diseases they may show, whether this is any relation to such things as schizophrenia, for instance. We haven't carried out uh, enough of this kind of observation, I think, to speak with any authority here, as to to judge the results, except as we've always judged them, how well people have done, and we trace back into their history and see what uh, factors have entered into that history. The same thing with psychoanalytic methods use. And you mentioned earlier the business about the inescapability of wearing multiple hats. The teacher as the administrator, as a personal therapist, as a part-time clinical research investigator, whatnot. Uh, is this just a matter of personal option and latent and demonstrated talent? Is there anything to be recommended as a, an overall in this regard? Well, I don't know. You see, I started my professional career as a teacher in a normal school uh, and had quite a bit of uh, education courses, and I'll be damned if I can learn uh, that uh, I use any of what I've <laughs> learned in those education courses. And if somebody pressed me as to uh, uh, when uh, I began to discover that uh, uh, I had some talent in teaching, it was almost at the point where I uh, said to myself, oh, I can't teach anybody anything. The only thing I can hope to do is to uh, play some role in creating a situation in which people who want to learn will learn. <laughs> did that you? Uh, did uh, would you like to have eliminated from your background your normal school and early teaching experience? Would you go uh, that far? I could get by without the normal school, but I couldn't get get by without the grocery store and the uh, uh, one-room schoolhouse for two years. Mm -hmm. See, I had the normal school experience and the teaching two years and so on. And in the courses in education, which have been invaluable to me in uh -huh. just so many 
different Your normal day. school graduates. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> um, yeah. How about oh, yeah. the other influences, though? Your home. Well, my home yeah. was was uh, essentially a uh, low middle class, uh, more peasant kind of home. And normal school to me was an opportunity to uh, uh, learn more than I learned about people in the grocery store, uh, sort of at a higher level who uh, who did little thinking and uh, who li did little planning and who had little finance. Did your parents favor you going to the normal school? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. Uh, it was uh, relatively immaterial to them what I did as long as I did what I wanted to do and of course I didn't that, want they to. They did want that though. Oh yeah, and I didn't want to work so I went to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, teaching is a way of avoiding work, as we thought of. Well, these were depression years, you know, <laughs> and uh, people would teach for, they taught for $80 a month, and that was the only way to. You got $15 more than I did when I started. <laughs> is that it? 65 was my first assignment pay, $3 a day until I got uh, an assignment. It was experience with uh, a different kind of person that was more significant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was raised in a village of 150 people. In Nebraska. Well, gentlemen, move along there now. Sorry, three quarters of an hour and you're on your horses. <coughs> Hate to be Simon. Well, I think both of research completely. Well, well, certainly there ought to be comments. Well, who's going to do this, and who ought to look into it? It I only just, needs two paragraphs. I three. just like to raise two aspects of research connection with te teaching. Uh, one is a negative aspect. It cannot be a command performance. It should not be a matter of gadgets, instrumentation, or formulae which are things that I think have been a good deal stressed. It should, on the positive side, be what um, Dana has said, an organized curiosity with the idea of discovery using any instrumentality that will aid in discovering things. I think this is about what it is on the positive side. And I think in any teaching that we do, we should keep these principles in mind, just sending a fellow down to the laboratory to do more than observe and see if there's interest in being engaged, I think would be a mistake. Now, let me then address this question to the specific operations that have been invoked for several years. There is the phenomenon of career teacher and career investigator. These are purposefully sponsored, purposefully planned opportunities presumably made available to persons who have the requisite of motivation that you've spoken of. Are these desirable? Should they be encouraged? Should they be augmented? Should more funds be poured into this to make it possible for people that land in career teaching and career research? Should we then, in, in our report insofar as the teaching of clinical psychiatry is concerned, urge uh, greater wealth of public funds to be put in this direction or allow the spontaneous motivation and the economics of the marketplace to determine who's going to go into teaching? I don't think the experiment's gone far enough so that we can answer. I've you got can't say anything about career this. investigators started. I still don't know how they're working out, so. Well, then you would suggest that this be continued at its present level of support? You see, there's another thing present level of support. They'll back a career teacher for five years, but after that five years, what happens to him? Where does he go? Does he go back for another five years, or who picks him up? Because he's moved along five years and people have moved ahead of him. Secondly, career teacher, very nice, but unless you have a number of papers, you don't get promoted up to associate professor or up to the tenure job in many places. Of course, they try to provide for this by getting uh, informal agreement from the medical school.
school, which the man goes, but he will have a faculty position. What faculty position? How far he go? Of course, he can't the end of his grant, out he goes. And if he isn't good, he shouldn't get it. He won't get it, I'm afraid. But, I mean, is this a good thing in principle? Should it be con I don't know. conserved, I would encouraged, supported, so. augmented? I would think both of them should to get it further along. There's always a possibility we may discover some better way of promoting this kind Danger of thing. I, I can't say that I'm too strongly impressed this is going to be successful. Some of the colleges... But I'd be open-minded about trying it. ...are simply moving a man over for whom they're paying. They're moving him over on to a career teacher or research grant. This is well known. Um, one of my favorite... Uh, Harvard won't take one. ...favorite themes on this, which I tried to advance at the Trial Study Association in New York Monday, is that we should uh, get away from this idea that research is only in the field of advancing knowledge. Research can be just as basic in the field of trying to learn how to apply knowledge. We have so much more known now than we are using in any sensible way that we need just as much research work done in trying to apply it on a large scale towards the improvement of human relations as we do towards getting additional knowledge. Uh, this is a point that I've heard Eric Erickson uh, talk about uh, at some length is one that's very much needed and which is very unpopular. The refinement of uh, present knowledge. Yes, you can't get Make anybody more interested in helping to, to see how to get uh, knowledge applied in ways where you can determine whether it'll be uh, useful or not. Orville Brim, you know, fooled around down the Child Study Association for three years, came up with a book on patterns of child rearing in which he gravely uh, stated that there was no proof whatsoever that good child rearing practices have any advantage over no child rearing practices or poor ones. Now there's another point somewhat separate from this that I think we have to ask, uh, ask ourselves. And this has to do with, are there a sufficient number of teaching opportunities and teaching centers in the country to meet the needs for psychiatric education at a graduate level? Are there too many? Uh, is it just right? In other words, as we see the situation now, uh, numerically, in a quantitative sense, are we to suggest to the conference that the quantitative availability of psychiatric training at a graduate level in the United States in 1962 is adequate, inadequate, or uh, Hyperplastic. It's adequate looking at it from the overall uh, point of view. No, speaking only of numbers, it is inadequate in that the diversity of quality is uh, much greater than it should be. You have the exceedingly good ones and you have the very poor ones. So that overall, it is still inadequate. Is it within our purview to suggest? <coughs> that the current level of three-year training in psychiatry chronologically be considered adequate, inadequate, uh, what? Let's improve the quality and not the quantity of time. Please. You mean not be concerned with the number of years? No. no. Three so that not. if, well, is one too few? Well, three is, is a, an empirically arrived at number which seems to be working and which does not uh, postpone uh, the person's uh, senescence too far. They have found ways of combating this, namely by getting their families... But you could do better to overcome this hypermaturity that you lament if you cut it to two years. Would you be willing to? No. So the three is just right in mm -hmm. terms of time. As I said, right at this moment, yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
uh, this has some uh, some support from some of uh, the work at Vassar, indicating that in the educational scheme of things, in late adolescence and young adulthood, you pretty nearly have exhausted all the advantages of a new situation in three years. Or begin the fourth year and you're living it over again. Uh, two years you haven't explored sufficiently all the possibilities of the new stimuli, the new situation. That is, four, a four-year college course is probably, according to this inference, one year too long. It would be better. But is a three-year postgraduate course? This is not only beyond college, but beyond medical school, beyond internship. Is this too long? I can see it at age 21 to 23. I'm now talking about 30 to 28 to 33. Is this three years? You still hope for the three years? Well, the Trinity is a trike. Trike. Uh, it's very satisfying. Yes. I suppose we had three years of high school, three years of college. Well, we can't three do about of, that. Three years of uh, graduate work in one or the other of the professions, and then in the more complicated ones like medicine, another three years, which is has uh, somewhat more specialized, and then another three years for those who, for a variety of reasons, wanted to take on something new, such as research training or a uh, specialty within a specialty or the like, you still could get out uh, before you began Sorry. to get. Is it within our purview to spend any time talking about the desirability of uh, concurrent psychoanalytic training during uh, an active three-year residency program, or is this beyond our... That's reasonably uh, well settled out of that last deal, and I think very sensibly so. Out of what last deal? The last meeting that we had uh, the Cornell conference. Well, that was one of the the usual level. fashion for the time. Well, it wasn't on the undergraduate level. It suggested that a first-year resident certainly well, the what chairman I'm asking of the section the on psychoanalysis because Dr. they Gertie. couldn't get an analyst, why uh, we've got it here. <laughs> yeah, but I was wondering whether whether we ought to do anything to change that stand now, in the light of ten years' knowledge. My vote would so. be no. See, the institutes have pretty well uh, gone along with the conference in that, uh, let's say, I don't know much about the other, but the Boston Institute requires one year of residency before a Class A candidate can uh, apply, and then it takes uh, oh, this is about page to, a year for they accept it. to to process and get started. So that uh, probably in his third, third year, year of residency, he's ready to I start. I certainly wouldn't want to hurry it any more than that. Hmm. Now. Even though you say you wouldn't uh, want to hurry it, and you also earlier lamented the hypermaturity that comes about as a consequence of protracted residency status, and then yeah, I will hark back to the comments of Dr. Cobb that were repeated yesterday. Yes, but the psychiatric training and psychoanalytic training are different enough that you have a new set of stimuli. You're, uh, you're uh, keeping your mind open uh, a little bit longer than you would otherwise. You start analysis in your first year, you'll grow up rather than broad. It now is what, seven years? Well, uh, let's say a man starts his personal analysis in September. He can start his theoretical seminars if things go well the following September. And if things go well, he can start his clinical seminars the following September. So, uh, uh, How long will they run? We've well, uh, got a personal analysis of 400 hours to do. Well, yeah. But he, uh, now uh, you can do a certain amount of uh, both at the same time. You see, we didn't used to start seminars until after the personal analysis was over. But now if a man is uh, doing his analytic work, he can start his theoretical seminars at the end of the first year and his clinical seminars at the end of the second year, his controls at the end of the third year. And uh, he, uh, men have done it in five years. Usually it's six, seven, I think and strong. ten. We get off the worried. Ten, you worry. Yeah. A resemblance between this and the candidates for the PhD degree. The pretty well integrated, well organized fellows going ahead and going to get by his preliminaries and get mm -hmm. his thesis written and get his PhD does it. 
the same kind of fellow deciding that he wants to become uh, psychoanalyzed and fully approved and blessed in that field goes ahead and he does it on schedule. The others don't. I have one uh, who has is on his uh, Nach analysis uh, with me, who's been a candidate ten years, and uh, he's getting awfully pushed to make up his mind which way he's going to go. <laughs> uh, uh, mm. Well, can we finish this up, Joe? Finish up, run right through that. Right down. Down. We're all through with it. Would you say I something about time, time to think now. about teaching? Time to think about teaching? What do you mean by that? You mean the burden on the teacher in terms of hours per day, per week, per month, per year? You mean his teaching load? You see, uh, so much of the psychiatric teaching, whether it has merit or it doesn't have merit, is really on borrowed time. That's right. It's what uh, each one of us really takes away from duties that we uh, really are primarily committed to and, and uh, paid for and paid for and teaching is sort of just incidental and uh, after the f after the fact well, that's uh, part of this overall picture teaching is relegated to a second place and well it is in society and I mean it seems to me that we reflect in psychiatric graduate education the status of teachers in uh, our culture as a whole change this from teaching to training how about it then well, we have always said that because our primary focus is on the patient, in effect, on the job training is what we do. And so since we are occupied with the job, this is a transmuted version of Osler's bedside teaching uh, in terms of your clinical duties. And so in this sense, then, it is not subordinated to, but ra rather it occupies a para position in relation to clinical responsibilities in most places. That's, that's all right for the trade side of it. But then we have the, uh, the education side of it. At a graduate level? I'm not talking about undergraduate medical school now. Graduate level, yeah. residency. Yeah, I mean, you have that aspect of, of uh, your, the work with our residents. Uh, what do you do? When do you do it? Why do you do it? What is it all about? Uh, and then you have the whole area of uh, what did Janet think, what did, uh, uh, how did Kraepelin uh, 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 contribute, how did uh, uh, Adler deviate from Jung, and so forth and so on. Uh, well, well learning were full-time teachers. These were clinicians. These were clinicians par excellence whose, whose involvement in teaching merely grew out of a personal motivation and experience. Well, maybe that's the and way if they're the prototypes, if they're the prototypes for teaching in, in graduate psychiatry, why should we deviate? Well, you have well, to the distinguish between point. teaching and education and learning. They may have been very uh, good in getting people to become educated, that is, to learn, without ever having done very much in the way of teaching except to propound their own theories about things. But haven't we indicated that a teacher functions best when he functions as a catalyst to participate in whatever the internal experiences are within his view? Right. But then when we get to talk about teaching, Contrasting it with that, we begin to think about what courses we can give, what curriculum, what we can tell them, what content we can impart, what information we can hand them. You mean the formal structure of it? This is teaching, actually encouraging learning, enabling a man to uh, go ahead with his education. Well, then what different? But I gather that we five have, with our emphasis on what's done in Carter's, what's done in extracurricular activities, what's done in supervision, tend in effect to decry the tendency to formalize uh, such opportunities. Not that it's not to be considered a part of, but rather a minor part of the formalization. Formalization should be inconspicuous, but should be very much there. Sort of. It's 
sort of like the tea and bathing. It ought to be there, but you ought to be able Like a good fire department or police department, not too conspicuous. Yeah. So that, work. so that at the end of a three-year period, the supervisor of training or whoever the head man is can reflect in terms of his resident, John Jones, and say that he has had a pretty good uh, exposure to all that is known about schizophrenia and about this and this and this and this, and, this and he knows a good deal about uh, history taking, he knows a good deal about coordinating all these different sources of, of information he does that has a good deal of knowledge of himself and have all those things which we are going to put in this core curriculum that he can say he has been exposed to this uh, even though uh, it has not been in a stereotype fashion that today boys or this month we're studying this and this month this and this month this like your history outline. You have that in your mind, but you don't get it necessarily in the order in which it is in your mind. That's your checklist, so it says you've got all the points in. That two pages and a half that I gave you from Paul Walters is on that theme of compartmentalization, which he decries very vigorously. Now, since we have all been the products of graduate teaching in psychiatry, we and the other members of this conference, my would it help? Not I. I. No. Hmm? By North. part-time clinicians? Well, I'm talking about by part-time clinicians. By we but I mean as a product as having been produced by it, not I. Well, I've had no psychiatric training either. Well, I've had not been talking about it. Well, we, we were on a strike. We didn't have any. Well, yeah. but this is my point. <laughs> uh, this is precisely the point I'm coming to. Would it be helpful for us to poll by, say, class segments of five-year spread, the members of the conference, and get some anecdotal material on what what teaching they had, if any. Now, when I stop to think about it, and this is what led me to it, I don't remember having any teaching. Oh, you got it, sense. what I gave you. This was just sort of a... I recall my teachers, but I never osmosis, had any teaching. Osmosis and... and, and around there. And, and I did a lot teaching. of reading. Yeah. <laughs> I tried experiments of and, a kind. And they were nice, warm, affectionate, gentle, supporting people. Now, this is my point. Would it be helpful for us to go through and pick off in the conference people, say, 65 to 70, people 60 to 65, 50 to 55, so on, right down in age segments to give us some idea of classes and to get some anecdotal accounts from them as to their own personal thing? After all, now we're setting up, if, if what we say now and have said yesterday and today is to be a model for tomorrow, it stands, as I see it, in radical contrast to what it was that we personally had. Now, does this mean that we are dissatisfied with what we had and what we are, that we're now recommending a new brand for some subsequent generation? Well, it's like a history of the stock market because there's an aid in prognostication. What the performance has been in the past. make up a little... Uh, now, all I would want, because I wouldn't want to structure this, I would want just an anecdotal account of their teaching. Well, what what do they feel? They went through, we will assume, they went through something that's now called teaching. What happened? And could they, in a in a hundred word summary? It certainly wasn't structured till in the 40s. There were a, world, a lot of glorious people in this world who've done great things, who've written books, and while you could see and maybe hear a lecture or have them visit your place. And, uh, I think this has more to do with the process of learning than anything else. Well, if this is so... For me, I don't know anything about anybody else. We've against the wind with a funnel in our mouth. Uh, the uh, water, water. Water. Wonderful. I'm always huh? glad when I can hear that phrase from you. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> but look at this, then. Would it be worthwhile to write a sort of a round-robin letter to all of the members of the conference and ask them to just sit down off the top of their head, in a sense kind of a free association, and to write a hundred-word account anecdotally of their own teaching experience at a graduate level? Teaching? You mean, or no, uh, learning. what happened to their own learning experience? Yeah. What happened to them I, that I made think, them a psychiatrist I think you'll teacher? Have to make it so that how they learn. Yeah, the what, what happened to make you a psychiatrist teacher? 
Or you're likely to get some milk. Well, yeah, yeah. sure, that's all mm. right. Even if you... I just leave it open like this. And let's see what we get. How many of them were teachers before? They had psychiatry to teach, I think. Well, whether they mentioned or not in itself is going to be important, sure. for this is going to suggest to us what kind of influences are important. Could we hmm? ask them what kind of teaching did you encounter in your early career uh, that led you to become a psychiatrist? I don't like that. That isn't quite it. But it's uh, what well, are the important types of teaching which you encountered in the period in which you became a psychiatrist? Why you forward. were learning to be a psychiatrist? What were the procedures and influences which... Or what teaching influences were you subjected oh, to? Yeah. To be autobiographical. What's your opinion of them now? To be autobiographical for a moment, one book has influenced me more than any other book of all time in, uh, in, in developing my style of life and my range of interests. And that was, of all things, the... Uh, the Life of Sir William Osler by Harvey Cushing. Uh, it caught me just at the time when I began to see something beyond medicine, uh, which was exemplified by a physician. And um, it had nothing to do with my becoming a psychiatrist. As I would go over it now, I would be uh, rather unhappy about the lack of awareness of poor old Sir William. Uh, things psychological? Yes. Uh -huh. And it was uh, Gates been reading Sir William Osler's book who got so discouraged about the low condition of medicine that uh. resulted in the Rockefeller Foundation. <coughs> he read that book on his vacation. But there is a there is a matter of timing of having the right kind of a stimulus at the time when the student is receptive right. to something new, which we have not yet been able to define in any any degree of Teach your right back this that moment come up with your first impression of what you think it is that uh, pushed you along I know. you've told us into psychiatry now into psychiatry you're now talking about teaching and eventually in psychiatry uh, let's keep the two very separate i heard edward a stracker discuss these things and here was a man who could handle crazy people and there was the chief resident former chief resident at Jefferson who tried to kill himself, a surgeon, a good one, and when he was asked, did he want to see his chief, he said no. Did he want to see Professor Thomas McRae, no. Would he see Strecker? He said yes. That's what he wanted to see. Well, that's the guy to be. Guy to take care of the surgeons. They need I know exactly what got me into psychiatry. I was working on a research project doing, helping to do sympathectomies and partial adrenalectomies on young hypertensives and had to make rounds in the hospital at night before the, before I went to bed to see the patients who were operated on that day and went up to see a Mary Ann Thompson who died not too long after, a 21 year old girl who at two o'clock in the morning that Saturday night was crying and I asked her why she was crying and she said she was worried and I said, well, tell me about it, and she sat there, and she talked, and then I said, after a while, well, I'll order some medicine for you. She said, well, never mind, thanks, doctor. I think I can now go to sleep, and I walked out, and I thought to myself, well, what the hell went on here? And then the next day, I went to find out, I talked to the surgeon to find out, well, what about this business? I you think I ought to have some training in psychiatry, and he said, well, yeah, why don't you go out and see Dr. Bond? He knows about these kinds of things. But I'm sure it was that girl. And you were already along the psychiatric line? No, I was in internal medicine at the time. With uh, really no idea at the time of getting into psychiatry. I had been reading it. But, uh, As a matter of fact, he came out in order to take three months to learn something about anxiety. Well, I don't know. That's what you just me in doing whatever has been of interest to me, including teaching, eventually getting into medicine, and then uh, sliding down into psychiatry, I would have to say without much question was uh, my 
own father as a teacher and Charles Dickens as uh, something that I read. <laughs> now this seems strange, but this is yeah. about it. Isn't that amazing? Well, look at getting anecdotes. Has all of this been Love's Labor so Life? I think you probably would get a lot of very peculiar results out of this. It's like asking a medical student what uh, is interested in studying medicine, why he wants to do it. They uh, get some peculiar responses. There. Well, are you suggesting that this is not a profitable thing for us to do? They're going to be burdened with all kinds of yeah. queries and questionnaires, and we've got one that's I, really important. I, I don't. I, I think if I were honest, I'd have to say that. And I might have chosen something else than psychiatry. And I think Strecker once said something about this, is how he happened to study You know how he got to do it, you know. Sure. He wanted to get married. Yeah. First of all, he, he read an ad in that little uh, in that little <laughs> right. Philadelphia uh, medical society paper. He read this ad that they needed a job, needed.